Ends himself with some translation of Greek poetry and French works. And the last poem he writes is in 1799, the year before he dies, and he calls it The Castaway. And it's totally despairing. Now let me step back from this life and uh, reflect with you a few minutes on why or what is going on here. The melancholy is disturbing. And we need to come to terms with it in terms of God's sovereignty and his grace and the doctrine of perseverance of the saints and what in the world is happening here. And a man who is surrendered to despair right up to the end as far as it looks. First observation is this. There is an inconsistency in the report of his own mental condition. We must be aware of the inconsistencies in the reports of people's despair. Loaded as my life is, he wrote in 1784 to Newton, he always bared his soul most to Newton. Loaded as my life is with despair, I have no such comforts as would result from a supposed probability of better things to come were it once ended. You will tell me that this cold gloom will be succeeded by a cheerful spring and endeavor to encourage me to hope for a spiritual change resembling it, but it will be lost labor. In other words, that's the kind of thing you'll get typically from a person in utter despair. There's no point in talking to me. I know what you're going to say. I've heard it all, so don't bother. Nature revives again, he says, but my soul, a soul once slain, lives no more. My friends... I know, expect that I shall see yet again. They think it necessary to the existence of divine truth that he who once had possession of it should never finally lose it. I admit the solidity of this reasoning in every case but my own. And why not my own? I forestall the answer. God's ways are mysterious. He giveth no account of his matters, an answer that would serve my purpose well as theirs that use it. There is a mystery in my destruction, and in time it shall be explained. Absolute despair of being elect and going to heaven. Notice, though, that he is affirming the doctrines. This is, this is why it's so frustrating. He knows everything you could tell him, just about. Now, here's the inconsistency. In that same year, when he was writing that letter to John Newton, he was writing the task, book three. And in book three of the task, he tells the story of Christ's deliverance in his life in a way that I cannot believe that he would write it with such poignancy if it had no abiding effect on him. Let me read you these lines from the task. I was a stricken deer that left the herd long since. In other words, I'm a loner. I've always been a loner. With many an arrow deep in fixed, my panting side was charged when I withdrew to seek a tranquil death in distant shades. There was I found by one who had himself been hurt by the archers. In his side he bore, and in his hands and feet, the cruel scars. With gentle force soliciting the darts, he drew them forth and healed and bade me live. Since then, with few associates, in remote and silent woods I wander, far from those my former partners of the people seen with few associates and not wishing more. I find it so hard to believe that whether it was morning or evening when he wrote those lines that he felt exactly the same way he did when he wrote that letter. There's something not quite consistent here in 1784. In the 1790s you get the same thing. There were expressions of hope in his letters from time to time. He said once prayer had ended for him, basically, in 83. And he said in the early 90s, once more, I have been permitted by God 
to approach him in prayer. He said that in one of his letters. Once more, I have been permitted to approach him in prayer. His earliest biographer said that in the last decade of his life, there were frequent open passages like that, but at night the spiritual hounds haunted him. There was a horrible blackness for him most of the time. Now, Newton never gave up on him, and he visited him in 1792. And he said to Newton, I feel like I'm always scrambling in the dark upon rocks and precipices without a guide. Thus I have spent 20 years, but thus I shall not spend 20 more. Long ere that period arrives, the grand question concerning my everlasting weal or woe will have been decided. Now that is not a statement of ultimate despair. That statement has a window of hope in it because that's the effect that Newton's presence generally had on him. He came to die and um, a doctor visited him and he said to Dr. Lubbock, in April of 1800, I feel unutterable despair. And on April 24th, the, the maid came in, Miss Perone, and offered him something to eat, and he said, what can it say? Scarcely been more tragic. His father and mother married in 1728. By 1731, when William was born, three babies had been born and died. After he was born and lived, his brother John, the only other living sibling, was born six years later. And in that period, two more children were born and died. So they had five dead children in this family and two living. And Three days after John is born, his mother dies. And that year, his father sends him to a boarding school. It's um, a calamity-ridden origin that bodes ill for the, for the future. Now, let's think about the death of his mother here. Uh, I wouldn't make much of this if he hadn't made much of it. There were no photographs in those days, but there was a portrait when he was 59, as I told you, 59 years old, 53 years, his mother had been dead. He'd never seen her for 53 years. He is sent by his cousin a portrait, and he opens the mail, and the flood of emotion that comes over him is almost too much for him to bear. And the poem that he writes to give relief to himself carries with it the kind of observation that gives you maybe a little glimpse of what a six-year-old boy feels having lost two siblings at birth and now lost his mother and being about to be sent away totally alone. Oh, that those lips had language. Life has passed with me but roughly since I heard thee last. My mother, when I heard that thou wast dead, say, wast thou conscious of the tears I shed? Hovered thy spirit o'er thy sorrowing son? Wretch, even then life's journey just begun. I heard the bell tolled on thy burial day. I saw the hearse that bore thee slow away, and turning from my nursery window, drew a long, long sigh and wept a last adieu. Thy maidens grieved themselves at my concern, oft gave me promise of thy quick return. Ardently I wished, I believed, and disappointed still was still deceived by expectation every day beguiled, dupe of tomorrow even from a child. That line is really moving to me. Dupe of tomorrow, even from a child, meaning tomorrow always tricks me. That is, if there's any glimmer of hope in tomorrow, it never comes true. Dupe of tomorrow, even from a child. I can't help but ask whether the strange relationships that William Cooper had with women 
were in part owing to this great tragic loss. He never related normally to a woman 